Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's presentation um, on our emergency, oops, I'm sorry, on our uh, ingest service. We're gonna talk today about ingest and contributing content to Hathi Trust. Um, I'm here with Natalie Fulkerson, our collection services librarian, and Erin Elkis, our enterprise architect. And I'm just gonna provide a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, just keep in mind that we would like everyone to keep our video and microphones muted today. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat window. Um, we do have a couple of staff on hand um, monitoring the chat window, but most of the questions I will read out loud at the end for Natalie and Aaron to answer. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm Natalie Fulkerson, Collection Services Librarian at Hathi Trust, and I would also like to welcome you to today's webinar. This is our first ever webinar focused solely on ingesting material into Hathi Trust, and we're glad you're here with us today. I'm joined by Aaron Elkis, our Enterprise Architect, and you'll hear more from him a bit later on. Our goal for this session is to introduce you to the basics of HathiTrust ingest and provide a starting point for those of you thinking about what to do with digitized materials you already have in your collections or that you might create in the future. Whether you're thinking about ingest for the first time or you're here for a refresher, we hope you'll learn something new today. So here's our plan for today. First, we'll review some terminology to make sure we're all working from the same common vocabulary going forward. We'll show you some statistics to give you a sense of how the ingest process contributes to the growth of the Hathi Trust collection. I'll suggest some possible reasons why your institution might want to deposit digitized content with Hathi Trust. And then we'll spend some time looking at how the process actually works. We'll spend a few minutes on how ingest fits into the broader content management lifecycle at Hathi Trust, And then we'll wrap up the first section of today's webinar with a look at some of our future plans. That should leave us about 30 minutes for questions and discussion, and we'll end no later than 2 p.m. Eastern time. So what do we mean when we talk about ingest? At Hathi Trust, Ingest refers to the set of processes on our end that bring content into our digital repository. We also use the terms submission, contribution, and deposit. And these describe the other side of the process. In other words, the work that takes place on your end to prepare materials for ingest into the Hathi Trust digital library. So what we do is ingest. What you do is deposit. For simplicity's sake, we often refer to the whole thing as ingest, and that's how we'll refer to things today. Throughout the presentation, you'll also hear phrases like digital object, submission package, configuration, content stream, and other technical terms. These refer to various aspects of the ingest workflow, and we'll talk about each of them in more detail a bit later on. The next few slides have some visuals to help communicate some of the characteristics of our collection. You'll see references to Google, the Internet Archive, and a term local, which means material that you digitize either on site in your library or through a vendor that you then submit directly to us for ingest into Hathi Trust. These are the three ways that content comes into our collection and we'll also talk about each of those a little more later in the presentation. So as you can see here, 38 of our members have contributed or are contributing now locally digitized material to Hathi Trust. 29 have contributed their Google scanned items and 19 members have contributed items scanned or hosted by the Internet Archive. And as you can see by the intersections on this Venn diagram, a number of our members are participating in two of these processes and a few are participating in all three of them. 
this graph shows how many items have reached the Hathi Trust collection via those same three sources. About 94.5% of the content in our collection came from the Google process, 3.6% from Internet Archive, and about 1.8% from the locally digitized workflow. This one is my favorite, this graph. I stole it from an analysis we did in 2018 for our 10 year anniversary. And you can find more information, including this graphic and others on our website at the link at the bottom of this slide. The graphic shows each contributor to HathiTrust and their proportion of that year's ingest. So you can see that in the beginning, two contributors were responsible for everything we had in the repository at that time. By 2018, 60 members had contributed at least one item to the HathiTrust Digital Library. Okay, so why as a HathiTrust member might you want to deposit your digitized materials with HathiTrust? Here are a few things to consider. First and foremost, HathiTrust was founded to support shared investments in the infrastructure, workflows, and services needed for the long-term preservation and management of a large digitized collection. That remains our core mission, and many members continue to rely on HathiTrust for digital preservation. Over time, our service portfolio has also grown to include our shared print program. So if you're interested in print preservation, you may wish to deposit materials with HathiTrust in order to make them eligible for that program. We also support several modes of access to our collection, including both catalog and full text search for all items, online reading access for all public domain materials, and access to in copyright materials under certain conditions. For example, our accessible text request service provides reading copies of any item in the HathiTrust repository for members of your community with documented print disabilities. And the HathiTrust Research Center supports computational access to the entire HathiTrust corpus for text and data mining or other forms of digital scholarship. This year, Many of you have also seen a return on the 10 plus years of shared investment by our members in the HathiTrust collection with reading access to in copyright materials made available through our Emergency Temporary Access Service or ETAS, which we released in late March in response to widespread library closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So before we go further, we have a couple of questions for you. For this first poll, we'd like you to answer the following question. Which of these choices best describes the main benefit of ingest for your organization? And you should see this poll in a new pop-up window on your screen. Melissa will put the results up on screen in a couple of minutes and we'll talk briefly about those. We'll wait just one more minute, I think. Great, okay, thanks everybody. I'll share the results. 
it looks like most of you indicated you wanted to make your digitized content available to the broader community, which is great. We love that answer. We see all of these answers as valid. And if you were the person who indicated don't know or something else, we're especially glad you're here today to learn more about the ways that HathiTrust Ingest works and might work for you and your community. So I'll stop sharing those results. And we have one more question for you. Before we move on to look at some workflows, if you've thought about this at all before joining today, we'd like to know more about the kinds of materials that you might be thinking of for ingest with HathiTrust. This is an open-ended question, so please type your answer into the chat window. We'll give you just a couple of minutes for that. I see books, books and manuscripts, special collections, newspapers, rare books, oral histories, cool federal government documents, and then materials that are specific to your institution. Terrific. This all sounds great. There's a real diversity here in the kinds of materials that you're thinking about, and we love that. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. This is really helpful information for us. I think before we move on, we'll check in real quick with the chat. So Melissa, do we have any questions that we should answer at this point? We don't have any questions yet. Great. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. All right. So now to talk a little bit about ingest workflows and how the process actually works, I will turn everything over to Aaron Elkis. Hi everyone, I'm Aaron Alkis, the Enterprise Architect for Hattie Trust. If we could go to the next slide. Thanks. So before we talk in detail about what the ingest workflows look like, we're going to go over a few terms, some of which we've mentioned and some of which will be new. So first, Zephyr is the system that manages the bibliographic metadata for items in Hattie Trust and it's run by the California Digital Library. A content stream is our term for items from a particular contributor that have been digitized and submitted in a particular way. So you might have one content stream for items you've digitized via Internet Archive and another for items you've submitted directly to us. A digital object is an item in Hathi Trust, which is typically a scanned physical book. A submission package is what we call the files that you submit to us that contain the scanned images and OCR and other things for the item you send to us. And as we mentioned earlier, ingest is what we do when we accept material from you and put it into the repository. And deposit is what you do when you send us material to put in. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about the different variants we have of ingest. So as Natalie mentioned, the bulk of the material in Hathi Trust was scanned via the Google Books project via Hathi Trust partners who also participate with Google Books. The process that we have for that is highly automated it's large scale and the decisions about material scan via that are a joint decision between the partners who are scanning and Google itself. Some libraries also work with Internet Archive for digitization and hosting of their material. Internet Archive does not, however, commit to long term preservation of those materials in the same way we do. So many institutions also like to deposit it with us we can accept those materials. For this material, you as the library select what material 
to be scanned. You can either digitize it on site yourself or via Internet Archive, and then it's submitted to HathiTrust via Internet Archive. The last workflow is the main one we'll be talking about more details of, which is what we call the local workflow. So it's similar to the Internet Archive workflow in that you select material, you can digitize them yourself on site or via a vendor, but then you submit them directly to us. And to date, we've had 39 members contribute material to us via the local workflow. So next slide. So what are the requirements for getting set up for ingest and then for actually depositing material into HathiTrust? For each digital object, which is typically a single scanned physical volume, we also require a complete MARC bibliographic record describing that item. So we'll talk some about our bibliographic metadata requirements in a minute as well. And we need to have the complete scanned volume which meets our technical specifications, and we'll cover those specifications in a minute. Those also need to include OCR, so optical character recognition text, if possible, for the item. We also require a couple administrative forms. One is a digital asset submission inventory, which basically covers the content itself. Uh, it describe sort of what kind of content you'll be contributing and how much and authorizes us to take stewardship of that content. It does need a signature uh, from the university librarian or a dean of libraries or someone at that level. And because that signature can sometimes take a while to obtain, we're happy to review drafts of that form ahead of time. The other form, we, what is called the administrative cover sheet, and it outlines the format of the bibliographic records that describe the digital object. At the current time, we only accept marked metadata. We don't accept Dublin Core or MODS or anything else. So this is um, mainly for, for published book material, though we can accept some other kinds of material in some cases. And the administrative cover sheet outlines that configuration so that Zephyr can get set up to handle your bibliographic metadata. And again, that system is run by California Digital Library, so you'll also be working with staff there for bibliographic records. Next slide. So a lot of times what contributors are most interested in is knowing what they need to do to produce a package that we can ingest. So each digital object, again, a single scanned physical volume, needs to include an image file for each page in the physical volume we can accept either what we call bitonal or black and white images as scanned at 600 pixels per inch and saved as TIFF images. We can also accept grayscale or full color images as either TIFF or JPEG 2000 scanned at a minimum of 300 pixels per inch. If you do submit TIFFs to us, those will be compressed to JPEG 2000 in the repository, but because JPEG 2000 can sometimes be difficult to produce. We also accept the TIFF images and we can do the JPEG 2000 creation. We also require OCR at the page level for um, plain text for each page where that's possible to produce. And what we call this meta.yaml file, we have a template to fill out for that, which contains some preservation and administrative metadata for the object. And you can also provide structural information like page labels, or page numbers in there as well. Finally, in order to help verify that you transferred material to us correctly and that uh, we received what you intended to send, we also require some fixity information in the form of checksums. It's all packaged together as one zip per object and it needs to be given a unique identifier. That unique identifier also goes in the metadata and it should be something that you can track on your end so that if in the future you need to make changes to the content or the metadata, you're able to track that on your end. Generally, we accept submissions by uploading, you upload them to box.com, which is a file sharing site uh, similar to Dropbox. 
Then we download them from there, we validate them, and we report back any exceptions or failures back to you for remediation. We also have a couple tools that you can use to check things before you submit them. One lets you validate individual images and determine to what extent they meet our submission and preservation guidelines. And the other is a full package validator that will kind of check all the structure and the OCR and the metadata, but it doesn't currently check the images. And there's a link to that in the slides for those who are interested in that. Next slide. So now the bibliographic metadata requirements. So each digitized volume also needs to have a corresponding MARC catalog record for the original print version of the item. So not an e-resource record or a record for the digitized version. We do want to have that correspondence to the original print item. It needs to have the unique volume identifier uh, so that it, we can link it up to the content. It should also include the OCLC number for the item, which is not strictly required, but if we don't have that, it means that we can't kind of find other versions of the same item that other contributors may have deposited and it can make discovery more difficult. So we strongly encourage OCLC numbers where possible while still recognizing that there may be some unique or valuable material that you might want to deposit that doesn't have them. There's a few mark fields that are required, uh, title, author, publication date um, for serials or multi-part monographs. We want the enumeration and chronology information. Uh, there's a few that are strongly encouraged like the subject and language fields. That's all a minimum. So if you have additional cataloging for these items, we can generally accept that, but there are some minimum standards that we require. And catalog records, uh, currently they're submitted directly to Zephyr via FTP. Zephyr validates them prior to loading and again, any exceptions or failures are reported back to you. Next slide, please. So the setup process can take a while for all this with uh, the various forms and review of sample material. They were designed to accommodate significant quantities of material. So if you only have a few items to deposit, the way this is currently set up will probably seem quite heavyweight, although we're still happy to do that even if you only have a few items to deposit. Basically, the first thing we do is you will submit some sample content to us, typically for some page images, and then finally a complete submission package. And we'll review that and let you know if there's any errors or problems with that. Then you'll get the digital asset submission inventory form, which just as a reminder is primarily about uh, your content, uh, describing how much, how any details about that we need to know. Then you'll submit sample catalog records again for review and these get the administrative cover sheet set so that we understand your metadata configuration. All that kind of combination of those forms uh, and the samples will get our content stream set up. That's again, of a set of material coming from a particular contributor that is deposited a particular way. And then our bibliographic metadata configuration as well that corresponds to the content stream. Next slide, please. Currently, our local ingest processes are not highly automated and we process those weekly on Wednesday afternoons right now. If there's no problems with the submission, items are usually discoverable in Hadi Trust within a few days after we've processed them. We need to have metadata in Zephyr, the, the bibliographic metadata, before you submit the content. So typically, if it's possible to submit catalog records before the digital object by about 48 hours, that gives us the best chance of being able to ingest the content as soon as you send it. 
we do have a few reports and log files on our website that give you an indication of whether each item succeeded or failed in Jest and some explanation as to why, as well as a higher level report of how many items have been ingested and how many have failures. And um, for Google and Internet Archive contributors, it has some more information about items that could potentially be ingested, but that we haven't ingested. Next slide, please. I've been back to you, Natalie, for this part. Thanks, Aaron. So let's step back and look at the bigger picture for a minute. All of the ingest activities that Aaron was describing are just one part of the broader content management lifecycle at HathiTrust. Ingest or submission here is the first stage in that life cycle and it includes content and metadata validation and loading, as well as any required remediation for files that have formatting or other errors. After ingest is complete, a set of management activities takes place on our end, including rights determination, indexing, and service provision. These are the activities that drive features like search and display, as well as ongoing health checks for preservation purposes. We also manage two quality control programs, one for catalog records and one for the digital objects. Quality problems are most often reported to us by our end users, and these are tracked in our issue management system for resolution. Because we're a long-term preservation repository, I'm also listing migration as part of the full life cycle here. We do migrate content and metadata onto new servers as needed to ensure the health of those files and components. And we will also migrate to new content and metadata formats if that should become necessary over the long term. So where might we be headed with ingest in the future? We're planning or working on several improvement projects in various stages of completion. For example, better automation for locally ingested material. As Aaron mentioned earlier, this workflow is not highly automated right now, and we do see the opportunity for and value in making this a more robust automated workflow particularly in areas like queuing and file management and the notification process. We're also thinking about better reporting so that members can see more quickly and with more granularity which ingests might have failed and why and how to fix those issues so that the content can be resubmitted to us for successful processing. We're also thinking about better support for member side validation including tools that are easier for members to use, and the development of a package validator that includes the image validation process, as well as all of the current checks that are available in the package validator now. And finally, we're also exploring possible workflows for ingest of some born digital formats, starting with EPUBs, and then hopefully looking at certain kinds of PDF. So hopefully after having attended today's webinar, you'll be feeling a little better about how to evaluate whether ingest is something your library wants to pursue. If you're ready to work with us to become a contributor, you can initiate that process by emailing feedback at issues.hatitrust.org. This is our main help and user support email address. The emails we receive at that address are routed to our issue management system for tracking, and they'll be assigned first to me for follow up with you. And that brings us to the end of our prepared content for today's session. We have just about 30 minutes for discussion. So if you haven't already, please type any questions that you have into the chat window Melissa will read them out and we'll do our best to answer. I'll leave this slide up for now so that you can see the email address here. We will also share these slides out at the end of the presentation.
and I will stop sharing. And Erin, if you can turn on your video. First question, um, how big can the package be? And if you have to split it, does each package have to have its own checksum and YAML file? I can take that one. <clears throat> so if you upload to Box, there is a file limit there. I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head what that is, but it should be in the documentation for Box. Um, typically what we've asked people to do in that case, which has only come up a few times, it's in somewhere around the four to five gigabyte range, I think. And, and sometimes packages do exceed that if you've submitted um, full color TIFFs for a large item, um, is split the zip up into multiple parts, um, which I think like 7-zip can do by default, and then we can reconstitute it. And so it's a, there would still just be a single checksum and YAML file um, for the whole thing. Another option, if you do have a lot of large packages, is you can set up your own web server where we could download the items from instead of transferring them through Box. And that, that's worked well for, um, I think, Berkeley and UIUC have done that. Um, but it's no harder than getting stuff from Box if you're able to set that up and you have a lot of large, a lot of large packages. All right, next question. Uh, my institution has books hosted at Internet Archive, and we'd like to transfer them to HathiTrust. How do we start that process? So I can take that one. The first thing you'll do is email this feedback address that's in the slides, and the process begins the same way. All of those inquiries are routed to me for follow-up initially, so I will respond to you with some questions. Typically what we like to see are if you can provide some links to that existing content on Internet Archive. We check those out to make sure that we can access the content and that the material that's available there contains all of the kinds of files that we require for our submission and preservation guidelines. And then the bibliographic metadata part of the process is the same regardless of where we ingest the actual digital object material from. So you'll work first with me and then with CDL on getting your Zephyr configuration established for those catalog records. We do also require the same two forms that Aaron talked about in his part of the presentation, the Digital Asset Submission Inventory, or DAISY, and the Administrative Cover Sheet. How do you deal with bound volumes with a few publications? So these are tricky. We don't currently have a great way to expose in our page turner application uh, the sort of document or um, item level information that's contained within a single bound volume if it contains more than one kind of work. So for example, if you're sending us several issues or volumes of a serial that have all been bound together, presumably you have a catalog record that includes both the bibliographic level information for the serial, and then you'll be able to provide us with some specific information about each of the volumes and issues using the enumeration and chronology fields that Aaron talked about. Those we can handle and display with bound widths that contain more than one title or more than one work, discovery gets a lot more complicated for those and navigation within such a volume also becomes more complicated. So we can ingest those, but we would probably like to see samples ahead of time and we'll work with you so that you have a full understanding of where the limitations are in what we can show and how we can make those items discoverable so that you have enough information to decide if it actually is a good idea for your institution mm -hmm. to go ahead with ingest of those materials. I do have one thing to add about bandwidths. So if you are digitizing them locally and you are able to create identifiers and catalog records for 
sort of each separate part of those and send them as separate objects, then it will work better in our interface. But then maybe it will create problems for tracking it on your end. So unfortunately, we don't have a great solution for bound widths right now. Next question, uh, what are our support desk hours and what types of problems or issues do we typically receive? I can take that one as well, I think. So HathiTrust user support is looked after by a team of your librarians and staff members. These are folks who volunteer their time in support of the collective investment and community that's part of HathiTrust membership. So each day we have different folks who are looking at the queue of tickets that come in through that main centralized system and they do initial triage and assign the issues to the most appropriate staff person, depending on the kind of question that you're asking. So for ingest, some of the problems that we encounter are things like um, image files that are scanned at too low of a resolution. We'll report that back to you. Um, sometimes we see problems with the embedded metadata in the image files, and we have some tools that we use to look for that, and we can explain more about those requirements. We do also have some documentation on our website that describes those. Um, the sort of preservation and administrative metadata looks for some time and date fields that have to be properly formatted. Sometimes the file itself is missing from the package or the checksum is missing from the package. And that's really all to do with the digital object process. There are all kinds of things that can happen on the bibliographic metadata side as well. Um, things like if your record contains more than one OCLC number and in our system, we would, we would assign each of those differently within our um, bibliographic metadata management system, we'll reject that record because our system can't decide where to put it in our system. So we'll report that back to you and ask you to either remove one of those OCLC numbers or perhaps think about another way that we can prepare that particular volume for submission. So those are um, some of the possibilities in terms of the ingest process. We get all kinds of other questions through user support as well, um, like missing pages in volumes or questions about the right status of an item. Um, I think I'll leave it there for now, but Aaron, if you have anything to add, um, feel free. No, that was pretty comprehensive in terms of the kinds of problems that we typically get when ingesting material. Thanks. I'll ask one, Erin, since you're up already. Um, how long does it take to set up a new contributor for local ingest? So like I mentioned in the presentation part, it can take a while to do that because there's a lot of back and forth and a number of forms and samples that we need to get. So I would say best case is a few weeks. Um, if everyone that's involved is kind of on top of things and responsive and we happen to be able to review samples quickly and get back to you quickly it could be faster but i think a few weeks is typically the fastest that we could do that uh, how does contributing affect member fees okay i'll take that one so there's information available on our website that describes the fee allocation process in detail. But what I can say here, and I'm certainly happy to answer more questions about this directly if you want to email the address, um, the feedback email address. What I can say here is that there's no direct cost for ingesting materials into the repository. The way that your fee can be impacted is in the sense that we would now have material in the repository that the membership as a whole 
takes a collective approach to stewarding and managing. So the fees that each of our members pay contribute sort of to our overall operating budget. And we allocate those fees for each member according to what you report to us as the physical contents of your collection. We call that the print holdings process. And I'm responsible for that process as well. So what can happen is if you contribute an item to the repository, let's say it's rare and it also happens to be in copyright. For in copyright materials, we divide the cost for managing that item across all of the members who also report that they hold that item. So if five members hold it, and we can tell that by doing some analysis of OCLC numbers in the print holding system, we would distribute the cost of managing that particular item across those five members. So in 2020, the per item cost is about 20 cents. And if you are the sole member reporting that you hold that item, that full 20 cent cost will be allocated to you. So if you contribute a significant number of items, thousands of items, you might see that reflected in your membership fee. But for a few items or for items that are in the public domain where the costs are divided equally among the entire membership, the impact on your fees should be quite low. Um, how quickly are items made available in the emergency temporary access service after ingest? So for the institution that contributed that item to Hadi Trust, your faculty, staff, and students would be able to check out that item via the emergency temporary access service, ETOS, right away. For other institutions that hold the item, which we determine via OCLC number, if if other institutions have reported holding the OCLC number for the metadata record for the item that you contributed, they will eventually get access, but it can take up to a month because of the way our holdings process works right now. We are looking at improving that process and hopefully at some point in the fall, uh, other institutions that hold the item would be able to get access within a few days as well. I'll just add that for the contributing institution, when we say that your access is made possible more or less right away, that's in line with the um, timeline for ingest that Aaron talked about a little earlier, typically two to four days after successful processing of the files. Uh, what kinds of materials are desirable for ingest into Hati Trust? I can take this one. So one of the things that I really like and find totally fascinating, particularly about the local ingest workflow, is that even though the materials that come in through that work stream represent a relatively small percentage of the overall collection, we see a lot of really interesting diversity in the kinds of materials that members are contributing to us through that workflow. Really because as the member, you have the agency to make decisions about what content you want us to have. And so we read some things into those decisions or we infer some things from those decisions about what kinds of materials are valuable to you or have been valuable for you and your community to digitize. Um, and so we, we sort of follow that, um, that contribution stream with great interest. So having said that, there are a few kinds of things that we are particularly interested in. And we'll have more information about this in a more formal way in the next, say, weeks and months as our program officer for collections, Heather Christensen, um, completes work on some strategic planning for the intentional growth of the collection over time. But we particularly, for example, are interested in government documents, so federal government documents, 
um, particularly in this current moment, we are interested in diversifying the collection and making it more representative. That includes materials about anti-racism pedagogy, for example. So in the last month or two, we've noticed that the top two or three items that are being accessed through Hathi Trust are anti-racism titles. And we're interested in that trend and phenomenon as well. Um, if you have particular materials in mind, go ahead and send us an email to this feedback address and we'd like to talk certainly more about what you have in mind. Okay, any more questions? I'm not seeing any more questions, Natalie and Erin. Okay, well then, um, thank you to all of you for coming today. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Um, we will make the slides available. And if you have further questions at any point about any of the parts of this process or anything about the specific circumstances of your institution, you can reach out to us at the feedback dot uh, sorry, feedback at issues.hatitrust.org email address, and we'll look forward to connecting with you there. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you everyone for attending.